Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the University of Sydney. My name is Duncan Ivis, and I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research here at the University of Sydney. And welcome to our campus, and welcome to the wonderful social sciences building here on our Camperdown campus for tonight's 2019 Michael Hintze lecture. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Gadigal people. The Gadigal are the First Nations people on whom this part of the campus is built. You know, and as we learn more, as I learn more about the deep history of this place, I'm always struck by the different elements of that history. So on the one hand, we have this extraordinary uh, Victoria Park. If you're coming onto campus off of Parramatta Road, there's that deep bowl in uh, Victoria Park. And that was a place where there was a lot of important ceremony, song, corroboree, also political diplomacy between all the First Peoples in the Sydney region. And at the same time, right across the road, there's Boundary Lane, which is a street that many of you are familiar with in the local neighborhood. And of course, Boundary Lane, a very old street in Sydney. Many Australian towns have them. And that was a, a street that Aboriginal people in the community tell me it was well understood they should not cross uh, after sundown. And there are people <laughs> in the community who, within living memory, remember that boundary. So the deep history of this place, we have to kind of grasp both of those things uh, at the same time. Uh, and it's a legacy about which we're very deeply honored to continue to engage with and very proud to be in that long tradition of learning. So let me acknowledge the Gadigal people, the elders past, present, and future. Well, it's wonderful to have you all here for such an important event in the life cycle of the Center for International Security Studies, which was established in 2006 through the extraordinary generosity of Sir Michael Hinsey. And I'm delighted that we have Michael Hinsey's wife, Lady Dorothy Hinsey, here in the audience with us tonight. Delightful to be able to share the event with the Hinsey family. And this extraordinary gift really enabled us to establish, I think, a, a, a new way, a new lens on international security studies. And through the leadership of a series of directors, but most recently and most importantly, uh, Professor James Adarian, who's here and will speak to you in a minute, we, the gift has been able, uh, enabled us to do a number of things. The first thing, of course, is conduct high quality research on foreign policy and security challenges, confronting not just Australia, but our, our region and our world. And at a time when the idea of a kind of pluralistic, multipolar foreign policy is increasingly hard to hold on to. It's never been more important to be studying and thinking about the past and future of that kind of security studies. It's also been a deeply multidisciplinary uh, project as well. And uh, Sir Michael's gift has enabled us to both do deep research and also policy-oriented research, <clears throat> traditional, non-traditional, emerging, established security challenges. And finally, it's been also about reaching out to you, reaching out to the broader community to engage the general public and the broader community in discussing and thinking about these pressing international security issues. We, our, our view is we take, uh, we take the knowledge and intelligence of our audiences seriously. And, and you've responded and paid back by turning up to uh, events like tonight. And as I said, uh, yet again, we have an, a, a wonderful uh, session for you. One of the best titles uh, of the year. Uh, Dr. Parag Khanna will be talking to us in a minute. And with that, I'd like to ask James to come forward and introduce our guest speaker, James. Well, first of all, thank you, Duncan, very much for the kind words, but also your your support over the years. And also to Dean Anna-Marie Jagos, who's the current Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science, who's been supporting this event for the many years that I've been director. So thank you both. And also to Sydney Ideas, a big shout out, our favorite collaborator for these events. It's great to have you all here for this event. It's a very special event. And none of this would have been possible, of course, as Duncan said, without the founding gift from Sir Michael Hinsa and the Charitable Family Foundation, 
And we are really delighted to have uh, Lady Dorothy Hintze here today. And um, we are very appreciative that she could be here for this 12th annual lecture, The Future is Asian, uh, which I just learned from Dr. Parakana in Britain has a question mark, but in Australia has none. So we're going to get a declaratory statement today, I believe, from Dr. Parakana. So thank you all for coming. I know there was other um, options today. There's this obscure local race called the Melbourne Cup, I heard. So thanks for coming and having a, a little flutter on the future. I think it's very important, um, this lecture, it might not stop a nation, but I think it really should give us some pause and opportunity to challenge what's become conventional thinking. Conventional thinking in national security circles, certainly, about what's going to be the global strategic race of the future. And I just want to quote from an earlier lecture. This is the fourth annual Hintze lecture. And um, this was the opening of that lecture. So fourth would be back in 2010. And the opening uh, statement was, I would like to argue tonight that Australians should be worried about China's rise because it is likely to lead to an intense security competition between China and the United States with considerable potential for war. Moreover, most of China's neighbors, to include India, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Russia, Vietnam, and yes, Australia, will join with the United States to contain China's power. To put it bluntly, China cannot rise peacefully. So said the distinguished scholar from the University of Chicago, some of you might have guessed by now, John Mearsheimer. So he said again when he returned to Sydney in 2019 with a similar talk on uh, Australia's choice in the US-China conflict. And so he's been saying practically every year in between. This is a recurrence in the way that realism creates these self-fulfilling prophecies. So, um, and he's not alone. The most, I think, recent account of this comes from the uh, also esteemed scholar from Harvard, Graham Allison, recently published a book called Thucydides' Trap, about how it's inevitable that a rising power will eventually confront a declining power and create fear in that power, and it will lead to war. And this is now almost a new consensus, and it crosses the usual left-right political divides, and it also bridges the usual distance between the realist and idealist camps in, in our field of international security. Now, the CIS mission is to challenge this you know, conventional wisdom. We pride ourselves in using critical thinking to address the most pressing global issues, security issues. And so I'm very, very happy today to have with us, I think, one of the most iconoclastic and yet influential thinkers who challenges the consensus view. Dr. Parikada was uh, born in India, um, Kanpur. He is educated at Georgetown University. And he was awarded his PhD in, at LSE. I have the good fortune to have read that. And where I first put you on my radar was because it was on diplomacy, a topic that we share. Rather than take the usual route then, which is usually a postdoc at a university or a governmental role, Dr. Khanna did something unusual. He went and retraced the Silk Route, the, the Silk Road that you know, Marco Polo had traveled. He did it, I think, by VW Bug. He did it by horseback. There might have been a camel involved, by foot, by bicycle. And he subsequently retraces this route. He's someone who lives his creed in, en route. He always interviews from the top down, bottom up, to get a on-the-ground perspective on what's happening in Asia. Unlike people like some of my colleagues at Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Chicago, Illinois, who rarely get out beyond you know, a speaking tour and the local hotels. So this is why we're particularly honored to have Dr. Parakana with us today. He's been a fellow at uh, the European Council on Foreign Relations, distinguished scholar at the Monk Center, University of Toronto. He's also uh, been at the New America Foundation, the National University of Singapore. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He has many other esteemed qualities, but anybody who can write six books in, I think, 10 years uh, not only deserves our respect, but creates a lot of envy. He has uh, a lot of admirers. He has a wide audience. I believe 650,000 followers on Facebook. He's a regular commentator on CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera. Uh, 
And he does have vocal critics, and that means we're going to be in for an interesting evening. Also, um, this evening, we were very fortunate to have, uh, for the interview section, we're going to have a 30-minute presentation. Then we're going to have um, some short an interview that we hope will prime the pump for the question and um, answers from the audience. And we're very fortunate to have leading this Siobhan Morgan McFarlane, who will might be familiar to you, or certainly familiar to anybody who listens to Eastside FM 89.7. I think it's the best news magazine on radio today. She is the producer, the writer, the host, and she also spins incredible music in between the various sessions. I highly recommend it. It's called Another World. And uh, we're very lucky to have her here today, even though she does have a Master's of International Affairs from ANU, we will not hold that against her. So. Thank you very much for coming. So with that, please join me in giving Dr. Parak Khanna a very warm Sydney welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Thank you, Duncan, for that uh, warm introduction as well. Thank you to the Hinsa family for your very generous patronage of uh, this uh, center and uh, this, uh, this opportunity to discuss uh, global ideas with all of you. And indeed, thank you for being here this evening. I don't see many faces hung over from the uh, Melbourne Cup. I see uh, if you had been there and watching, I don't see any of those pretty hats either that were uh, running around down by the harbor earlier today. And thank you as well to Sydney Ideas. For, uh, for co-sponsoring this event as well. This was the easiest invitation I've ever had to accept because it came from James Derderian. Now, many of you are surely uh, have been fans of his for a long time, but I have probably been a fan for even longer, and I don't even know if you know this story, James, but when did I first come across his work? Well, I was 19 years old, and I was just beginning my uh, study abroad year at the very left-wing Free University of Berlin. And there, as we signed up for these uh, you know, dauntingly titled classes in international relations theory, and um, students were, uh, were sort of flocking to put their names down to, for, the, for the end of semester presentations on various topics. So um, you know, it was a lot of Germans and me. And, uh, and you know, we had to, realism got snatched up. Everyone wanted to get it over with, basically. So realism, constructivism, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, neoliberalism. And so I, the, you know, I signed up. So postmodernism, not yet read postmodernism theory. It was postmodernismus, by the way, in uh, German. So at the time, James Dardarian's oeuvre consisted of, um, I believe at the time, two, two major books, uh, On Diplomacy and Anti-Diplomacy. And I had always been drawn to that subject uh, as well. So I leave it to you to decide what was more difficult, uh, having to you know, dive in and wrestle with these works in just a couple of weeks' notice and to prepare a presentation, or to translate it to German and give the presentation in German. I actually had to do both. Uh, but it was a very uh, you know, experience that I continued to sort of you know, reflect on to this day. It still inspires me to this day because a lot of my journey in IR theory kind of owes itself to that moment, to that semester, to, to, uh, to presenting on James's work when I was uh, 19 years old, and now I'm more than twice that age. And so you know, along that, that journey, the last 20 years, there are other instances for sure where I can say that because James, uh, you know, having gotten to know his biography and his story, went to England to study under the legendary Aussie, Headley Bull, to do his PhD at Oxford, I said, well, I want to go do my PhD in the UK. And I went to the LSE, which is another leading center for thinking about English school international relations theory. And that became the kind of methodological approach uh, for my PhD as well. And uh, this book is, is not, you know, sort of meant to be an academic book. And often what happens is, in, in any case, to the extent that there is an academic underpinning, you're forced to really bury it, you know, in the footnotes or an appendix or something. But I do want to say, say a couple of words about that. Because when I was in, uh, in London and sort of absorbing this English school approach, uh, a lot of the things that I learned then and studied then really did radiate you know, two decades later into what this his book has become. Because there is a great strength, a great virtue to what is probably the most sort of holistic and syncretic of, of international relations theory 
methodologies. Uh, for example, one of my early uh, supervisors, uh, Barry Buzan, if you're a student here, you've probably read some of his work, is really one of the only scholars in the last 20 years to make a very conscious approach to bring together Western and Eastern scholars to look for common ground in how people from these different academic backgrounds and civilizations view the world and construct theories of how the global system operates. And he was also one of the only scholars to take the region very seriously as a level of analysis. You know, we very often, something that I've critiqued from my first book to this one, we jump from the idea of the nation, you know, whether it's a small European state or the United States, to the global level with dis by and dismiss the geographic level and the gravity in between that is represented by your immediate regional environment. And yet, we know throughout history how important the regional context is in shaping any particular state's behavior. And the, um, and the third is, I've used this word already now, is the actual meaning of the word system. We just use the word system as if we understand what it means, but actually, in IR theory more generally, and certainly in the English school, we make an effort to try to quantify what it means when we use that word system. It can mean, uh, in particular, the gravity, the intensity of relations between a set of countries, and they don't have to necessarily be neighbors. It can even be at the global level. Things like the Commonwealth used to be a system, right? The NATO alliance is a system. The European Union is a system. Now I'll get into uh, why all of this matters for this book, because really the words Asia and system have never occurred next to each other in any international relations scholarship. If they had, I may not have bothered to write this book at all. Fact is that I, at least my intuition before beginning this project, was that there is the beginnings or the semblance of a resurrection of an Asian system. And I'm going to try and demonstrate to you today what that looks like. But importantly, I just want to highlight the fact that I use the word resurrection, right? Because there have been periods of history very clearly where Asia was a system. We would not be able to use a term like Silk Roads were it not for the fact that 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 500 years ago, Asians had more to do with each other than with the rest of the world. It's only in the early 16th century with the rise of uh, European colonialism in the Asian region where Asian societies, as you know, disparate as they still were given the rudimentary technologies of the day, began to be pulled apart from each other and those silk roads began to become more fragmented and Asian societies came to have more intense relations with their colonial masters and then in the 20th century with the US or the Soviet Union in the Cold War context, then with each other. So the, I spend the early part of the book kind of reconstructing the sort of 4,000-year history of Asian sort of relations through the lens of three forces, commerce, conflict, and culture, and arguing that it's in the last 500 years where colonialism, the Cold War, disrupted those patterns of relations between Asians, but particularly in the last 30 years, they've begun to reconstitute. Why is the last 30-year period in particular uh, significant? I see a lot of young people in this room who probably won't be able to answer the question where they were on November in the 9th, 1989. So in other words, 30 years ago, day after, day after tomorrow. Okay, raise your hand if you do remember where you were on November 9th, 1989. Not all that many. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about, what happened in November. Okay, a few more. That's good. So it was the day the Berlin Wall fell, right? And so a couple of days from now, uh, play maybe on Sherman's radio show, certainly on television, you're going to see a lot of iconic imagery of uh, what happened on that day. It certainly shaped my entire life because uh, shortly after the wall fell, almost immediately, I went straight to Berlin. My parents said, go live this moment. And we went and we saw the wall coming down. We actually rented hammers and chisels and hacked away at it ourselves. And I was in the eighth grade. So all, all of my subsequent decisions about sort of my becoming a geopolitical junkie sort of uh, began when I was just uh, 12 years old. So it's a perfect point to mark because from 1989 to 1981, 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union, we had almost three decades. And it's very easy for any of us who have grown up and you know, lived in and, and been sort of you know, uh, operating in a Western society to think about what the major milestones have been or episodes that have shaped the last 30 years of our Western experience. It's gone by in the blink of an eye, really collapse of the Soviet Union, the Balkan Wars, uh, tensions with Russia over uh, you know, NATO expansion, uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the invasion.
invasions of Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, the financial crisis, uh, Arab Spring, uh, Brexit, and Trump, right? So there you go. 30 years of history in one sentence, right? You know, nowhere in that, right? When we, when we think about that, that's, that's been the experience. That's what the world has been about the last 30 years. Not true, right? Because very little of those episodes have a significant bearing on the lives of about four, four and a half billion people, the majority of the world population that is Asian. For those billions of people, the last 30 years have very different set of uh, characteristics and drivers. And it's largely been about this resurrection of the Asian system that existed centuries prior. So now, let me get into that story, uh, you know, mostly now the kind of empirical story of this Asian system. So see, I've gotten the theory and the history out of the way. Now let's get into the sort of, you know, real world of today. The first is a geographic point. I, I want to be a real stickler about this because I do have some training in geography and no two geographers in the world actually disagree about what the sort of definition of Asia is. By, you know, the, the way map projections work by necessity, I've got Scandinavia and Western Europe here, but we left the names of those countries off lest one think that Italy is part of Asia. But here, the majority of this map is dominated by the countries of Asia. And I wanted to emphasize here, of course, that the so-called Middle East, you know, particularly the Persian Gulf countries that we have referred to as the Middle East by and large, are really West Asia from a geographic standpoint. They always have been West Asia, they always will be West Asia. And the Anatolian Peninsula, Turkey, that too is Asia. Most of Russia is Asia. Indian subcontinent, obviously, as well. And I, you know, I'm mindful, of course, that we are here in Australia, and very often people get very upset uh, down here, down under, when uh, the full Australia is not depicted on the map. Again, blame the cartographer only for the way in which the projection was done. But Australia, I think, of very much as uh, belonging to this Asian system, even if from a, a, a sort of geological tectonic plate standpoint, you might say it isn't exactly Asia. We'll get into that, of course, in due course. So. Why is this important to understand the, ge the, uh, the role of geography? Well, it's because when we talk about Asia in the last 20 years of you know, academic literature, policy literature, you tend to get books that are out of you know, 400 pages, 398 are about China, and about two pages are devoted to the other, say, 3 billion people of Asia, sometimes even less than that. And I thought that was somewhat problematic because that's not really the full Asia. And it leads to a whole lot of logical errors and strategic errors. For example, believing that you know, if China has a growing influence in the Pacific Rim, therefore it has dominated Asia. Well, it in fact has not because Asia is much bigger than just the Pacific Rim. It's an obvious example of the kind of oversights uh, that are committed. And it obviously leads to historical misunderstandings about how Asian powers have related to each other because there is this very long history of relations between uh, subcontinental uh, India, between the Central Asian, uh, Turkic civilizations. Russia has had a very important role in Asia historically as well, and so forth. So to understand Asia means to think about all of these civilizations and not view it purely in a Sinocentric context uh, as we do today. Now, let's talk about that last 30 years and what have been sort of the major trends that lead me to argue that there is a system-like quality to Asia, despite its incredible diversity. And the first and most obvious is trade. When we want to measure a system, we look at the intensity of trade between countries, their, how, what kinds of diplomatic relations they have with each other, how much they invest in each other, whether they have uh, tension and conflict with each other. These are all characteristics of a system. I should point out, by the way, that a system doesn't have to be peaceful. You know, over the course of this evening, we're going to have a lot of discussion about war and peace and conflict and geopolitical rivalries. All of that is evidence of a system. It's not evidence that I'm wrong in claiming that there's a system. A system does not have to be peaceful. The best evidence that you have a system is war between the members of a system. And this is an extremely important distinction that we make when we're studying systems in IR theory. If you just have a bunch of countries that are neighbors but have nothing to do with each other, they share a geography but they're not a system. If you think about Europe, we say, well, today Europe is a system, it's a peaceful system, but Europe has been a system for many, many, many centuries, and it's been a warlike system 
It's only very recently become a peaceful system. But the fact is it remains a system. So now, even as we discuss all of the conflicts that exist and will potentially break out in this region, let us not forget that that is, does not mean that it is not a system. It is the evidence that there are these frictions and dynamics between countries that are evidence of how intense their relations with each other have become, indeed more important than their relations with the rest of the world. And that's actually what this slide suggests. One data point is just the volume of trade. Now, I mentioned that 500 years of history has transpired in which Asians have been largely separated from each other, untangled from each other due to colonialism and the Cold War. It's t it took only 25 of the last 30 years from 1992 to roughly 2006 or uh, 2016, right? It took le less than a, a quarter century for Asia to overturn 500 years of this division and to arrive at this map, this infographic, where you see that the volume of trade between Asian countries totals by far more than Asia trades with the rest of the world, right? That's all it took is a generation for these countries to more or less recreate the Silk Roads, physically through infrastructure, trade liberalization, all of the complementarities that Asians have with each other. And that's so much of what economics is about, is optimizing land, labor, and capital. And if you think about the countries on this map, you have the West Asian, colored in pink here, the Persian Gulf, Arabian Gulf, oil and gas producers, starting in the 1990s, they massively shifted their export orientation away from the West towards East Asia, because that's when India and China in particular were rising. And so by the mid-1990s already, Arab countries were exporting far more oil and gas East than West. And we call that the sort of Indian Ocean or the maritime Silk Roads, in a way, were, were recreated through this, uh, what, what economists call the commodities super cycle. You also had the sort of uh, the, the early phases of rebuilding the infrastructural linkages that we now call Belt and Road. But as James uh, uh, mentioned, this is what I wrote my first book about. Uh, so this is going back more than 15 years where I, where, when we talk about Chinese infrastructure projects in Central Asia, like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan today, as if they've just been laid down, well, they've actually been being built since the day the Soviet Union collapsed. For about 30 years, these projects have been underway. I, there were so many of them going on that I was able to write an entire book about it more than a decade ago. So there's not, almost nothing new in some ways in that. It's all part of this process of rebuilding the Asian system. And that has allowed energy trade, agricultural trade, industrial trade, uh, technology trade, flows of finance uh, and of people to accelerate over the last uh, couple of decades. So if you take any blue line on this map, you could go back uh, 15 years, 10 years, five years to the present, and you'd see that all of those numbers keep on going up because these complementarities are very, very strong across Asian economies. So we're already at a point where in terms of measuring, again, the system nests right, of Asia. Asians already trade way more with each other than the rest of the world. Now, this is so important because Donald Trump really should have known this, right, prior to launching a uh, trade war. I'm going to give you some more uh, evidence around that. Now, let me come back to the point around why it's important to think about Asia as Asia, not just China. I remember presenting the Chinese edition of this book in, in, um, in Beijing in uh, June of this year, and um, and they said, oh, you know, we like. They said we like the title of your book. Uh, you know, the future is Asian. You're saying this is this is a Chinese world. I said, no, it's the Asian world, not the Chinese world. China is a part of Asia, but it is not all of Asia. So I feel I need to clarify. You know, a bit of a, a bit more around international economic history and how important it is to get this story right because the Asian story or or kind of. Um, rehabilitation that brought us to this moment we're at today really began after World War II. And then, of course, it was not China as the central economic fact of Asia, but it was, of course, Japan that led Asia's rebound. It took only 25 years from the end of World War II, 30 years, for Japan to overtake what was then West Germany uh, to become the world's second largest economy, only 30 years. And that industrialization and modernization of Japan is what inspired the tiger 
economies, right? And I refer to that as the second wave of growth, the tiger economies being South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and, uh, and Singapore. So the first two waves of Asian modern economic growth have nothing whatsoever to do with China. In fact, by this point, to be perfectly fair and, uh, and almost neutral about it, as you well know, in the 1970s, China is still reeling from the uh, Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. It's still a very poor pre peasant society at this point, 40 years ago, more or less uh, now. And then you get 1979, right? You get the 1978, 1979, the reforms, which allowed for Shenzhen, for example, to become China's first special economic zone, allowing in foreign investment. Then China begins to uh, you know, make those early steps to become the factory floor of the world. It builds uh, large trade surpluses and currency reserves and so forth, and the rest is sort of history. So China joins this story as the third wave of modern Asian economic growth. But now let me interject a geopolitical point, because when we think about how the relationship between geopolitics and geoeconomics, we tend to privilege the geopolitics and we say, well, these countries are still deep-seated historical rivals, and therefore you know, they can never contribute to each other's uh, uh, growth. That's not at all true, not even remotely true. Nothing could be more false, come to think of it. Because, of course, how did China get to be China? You would not have China as the superpower that we know it today if it weren't for, of course, Japan and the Tigers. Because who have been the largest, by far, most loyal, most reliable, most consistent investors in China in the last 40 years? It's the countries that we think of as its deep-seated, historically, uh, uh, deep-seated rivals, right? Of course, Japan in, in particular, Korea as well. Singapore and so forth, right? So you have not a story of these rival blocks. What you have is a story of mutually beneficial, mutually reinforcing waves of growth where more modern and wealthier economies invest in the poor, less developed uh, labor pools, uh, if you will, and that was China at the time. Now, here's the, now we've got the first three waves of modern Asian growth, and this is for far too many people, and in terms of that consensus that James was referring to, which is not just a geopolitical one that centers on China, but also an economic one, this is where the story ends, right? You know, if China equals Asia, if China is slowing down, well then that's the end of the Asian story. Also false. So a big part of my argument is that we are now entering this fourth wave of, uh, of Asian growth. We have entered, in many ways, this fourth wave. And it's comprised of all of these countries colored in orange, from Pakistan through India, Southeast Asia. Now, notice the population figure. You're talking about 2.5 billion people. And these are the 2.5 billion, among others, who just get left out, oops, of just about every book about Asia. It's just unconscionable. And I say it not as, as someone who happened to have been born in India. I say it just as a sort of objective fact. And now we're realizing, wait a minute, you know, here are two and a half billion people. The median age of every society, colored in orange, is, is younger, in many cases substantially younger than China's. The growth rates of some of these countries are faster than China's, well, not surprisingly, given that they're smaller economies starting from a lower base. But if you take these countries together, right, of these two and a half billion people, if they were to grow at only half the rate that China has, because China has at spectacular growth, 30 years straight, 10% growth, um, if they grow at only 5%, between now and the next 10 years, they will equal China's present GDP, right? And China is, in PPP terms, already the largest economy in the world. So we have just been blithely ignoring this entire set of, of sub-regions of Asia that are very core to Asia, that are critical to understanding its economic and its geopolitical future. So we've talked about a few anniversaries already. We've got the 40 years since China opened its economy, 70 years or since the founding of the modern uh, Chinese Republic, 30 years since the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. The anniversary that matters a lot to Asians from an economic standpoint is the Asian financial crisis. That was 20 years ago, right? 1997, 1998, 1999. Now, the, the Asian economies have spent much of the last 20 years just trying to make sure that they never have another episode or, or crisis as they did uh, during, during the Asian financial crisis. So they have been focused on some of the very kind of fundamental uh, economic reforms around trying to shore up their, uh, their trying to 
balance their current account, trying to build up uh, trade surpluses, build currency reserves, move towards flexible exchange rates, all of these things. And they've largely succeeded that, such that the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which to, to Southeast Asians is the great kind of bogeyman because of the conditionality imposed upon them during that Asian crisis, uh, the IMF no longer has any substantial presence in, in any important economy of Asia. There's a, there's a bailout now for, for Pakistan, but that is uh, a fraction of the volume of the bailout for, let's say, Argentina, right? So the IMF is not really a major factor. So from the Asian point of view, it's sort of mission accomplished in terms of undertaking the kinds of um, reforms that are necessary to grow as individual countries, but also to sort of coalesce into sort of a successful uh, economic region and continue to develop those complementarities with each other. They continue to do a lot of important things around economic uh, privatization. Some of the policies, by the way, that they rejected earlier merely because they were Western, right? Merely because they were forced upon them. They now recognize, well, this is actually a very sensible template no matter what part of the world you are in. So. So that's a very important example, and I'll give you more in time, of the kind of learning effects, where smart Asian countries are those that don't live in this mental sort of duality between accepting the West versus rejecting the West. The successful countries simply view the world as a set of uh, a menu, really, of policies from which you can learn and adopt and absorb to guide your own future uh, uh, reforms. So where do we stand today? Well, according to um, HSBC, Standard Chartered, and other financial institutions, if you measure the world economy in purchasing power parity terms, Asia is already 50% or more of global GDP. So it is in GDP what it already is demographically as well. And of course, you have the largest uh, sovereign wealth funds, you have multiple you know, nuclear arsenals, you have the largest mega cities, very high uh, financial market capitalization, number of unicorns technology and venture capital spending, and on and on and on and on. So much of this is already now concentrated in Asia. At the governmental level, you have sovereign wealth funds increasingly co-investing in each other's countries. You have banks creating more liquidity for, for trade and trade finance between uh, each other's countries, and on and on it goes. When it comes to trade, one of the most important things you have the, the evolution of trade liberalization from within ASEAN, ASEAN plus three. Just yesterday, we had the RCEP negotiations as part of the, the summit going on in Bangkok. They didn't manage to uh, ratify the RCEP. India has decided to, uh, to, to pull out. But you still have this process of, of you actually have about 20 different ongoing uh, bilateral or sub-regional trade liberalization agreements within Asia, even if RCEP gets, uh, gets, gets pushed off. And that, of course, represents the largest share of global GDP in a single uh, uh, trade framework. So all of these things are sort of moving along in terms of this Asianization of Asia, uh, as I call it. So you have, a, you have a geographical system, increasingly an economic system within Asia. You can see it from a demographic standpoint as well, because when you talk about complementarities between countries, what matters is not just what they can do with each other economically, but also demographically. Now, very often when we talk about Asia from a from Western standpoint, we say, well, Asia is aging, because again, we reduce Asia to Japan, Korea, and coastal China. But in fact, when you think about uh, Asia demographically, the full Asia, you also have most of the world's young people. And even in China, of course, you have as many young people below the median age as you have old people or older people above the median age. And the median age is about 45, 46. So not everyone who we call old is actually all that old. And of course, because the population of China is so large, you have actually 700 million people below that median age. So in other words, China still has more young people than all of Europe has people. So we have to take it with a grain of salt when people just say, oh, Asia's aging, it's going to collapse. Because that is one of these conventional wisdom things. You can write an entire book saying that and it'll be a bestseller in the United States. This is why I want to put a gun to my head, like, you know, when I have to deal with this kind of like oversimplification. So in Asia, in fact, because you have so many people, you still have a lot more young people than you have old people. And this is very, very important because 
you can see greater migration flows, right? You can measure this in terms of tourists, students, business travelers, and so on and so forth. And Asians travel much more within Asia than they do outside of Asia. So again, you can be on the streets of New York or London or in you know, Interlock in Switzerland and you'll feel like, oh my goodness, it's overrun by Chinese and Japanese. I'm not being very politically correct here. Uh, however, just remember, Asians actually, it's a lot cheaper for Asians to travel within Asia, and they do a lot more of that, and that is part of this process of, uh, of Asian societies sort of getting to know each other better in ways that have not been, been possible or not been undertaken in decades, if not in, uh, in centuries. So all of this is being made possible, obviously, because of urbanization, economic growth, you know, uh, uh, in, in many ways, barriers to entry, borders, visa requirements and restrictions coming down. So here's another part of the global conventional wisdom, right? Walls and borders are going up everywhere, right? And, you know, the examples that will be cited will be, you know, Trump's wall within, on the Mexican border, Brexit, and whatever, you know, Serbia is doing. And so that's not exactly the whole planet Earth last time I checked, right? Because if you look at the countries and the continents that have the most people, you have this week an African uh, negotiation, for example, to have a continental free trade and free mobility zone of 1.2 billion people. Here in Asia, you've got several billion people. Every single country in Asia has made it easier for people to come to, to travel. Uh, I remember spending hundreds of dollars to get visas back in the day to go to you know, Vietnam uh, and countries like that. Now, pretty much every country is visa on arrival, right? And most Asian countries now have these uh, entrepreneur visas, right? Very easy to apply for and get. You can stay five years in, uh, in a country, uh, even countries that are hard to migrate into, like Singapore. Pretty much no questions asked. Come, stay five years, start a business, work somewhere, and you know, see what contribution you make to the country. And, and if you remain employable, and if you, if you do, you can continue to extend and renew those things. Those things weren't possible. And clearly, it's a sign that when we have conversations about trends in globalization and presuming that globalization is backtra backtracking and receding and retrenching, I, I don't see that in Asia. Do you? And if you do, I'd love to hear your evidence, right? Because it certainly wouldn't stack up. Uh, it would have the weight of a feather. Uh, compared to the evidence that Asia is in many ways driving an internal globalization across this mega region, and of course is, uh, is externalizing very strongly. I'm going to come to that very, very soon. There's just a view basically that globalization is what happens basically from New York and London outbound. And if it's not that, therefore it is deglobalization. You know? And uh, that's just no longer in the same spirit of my not believing that we should use the term Middle East anymore because it doesn't really, it's not a geographically useful phrase and it doesn't really explain what's happening in West Asia versus North Africa. We really shouldn't view globalization as something that, that only happens if, you know, if the Trump administration allows it, right? There's all manner of globalization that is continuing to unfold all the time if we choose not to use only a narrow uh, lens. Let me stick just one or two more points around how this Asian story is unfolding. Now, I mentioned that it was the, the Japanese first wave and, and the Tiger second wave that helped to launch in a way, the Chinese third wave of Asian growth. And now this fourth wave of Asian growth is also being driven by wave one, wave two, and wave three. Because the largest investors in South and Southeast Asia, the largest investors in India, in Pakistan, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in Thailand, are, of course, other Asian countries, right? So again, instead of viewing uh, what's happening within this Asian system purely through the lens of territorial rivalry, we should appreciate that they're actually constantly developing and deepening their internal integration. And this is what this, uh, this chart is showing you. What, I'm do what I've done here is to juxtapose the median age of a country and its ranking and score in what's called the Economic Complexity Index that kind of measures the sophistication of an economy in terms of the, the, the quality of the goods that it produces. And what you see is that the countries on the upper right Japan, Korea, and Singapore. They are the old countries uh, of Asia, the Asian societies. And in the middle, you have clustered there those countries that are actually the, in, in the fourth wave, your uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, India, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, and so forth, and China. And what has happened is exactly the pattern that we've seen historically not just in Asia, but very much in Europe as well, which is that the aging wealthy countries 
start to invest more in the younger, uh, populous countries, and they offshore their uh, their manufacturing, their supply chains, and so forth to them, and help to sponsor their rapid economic modernization. This helps you understand why when you pick up the newspaper and you read about, say, you know, Samsung has just doubled the size of its chip and, uh, you know, uh, handset production in Vietnam, or Toyota is building ever more cars in Thailand and, and Indonesia. This is why, right? Those, those uh, anecdotes that you read about every day are part of a broader story of what I like to call, if you're not an economist, I'm not either, I play one on TV, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I call it adopt a country. Right, basically, what happens, and this is what exactly what happened in Europe over the last 25 years, is that the old, the aging and high labor cost Western European countries picked their favorite Eastern European countries from the Eastern Bloc, former Soviet Union, Warsaw Pact nations, to divert their own investment to to help to kind of develop those economies, and that's what's also what's happened in Asia is this adopt a country, uh, in some cases multiple countries. So again, it's Chinese money, Korean money, Japanese money, Singaporean money is all over this middle cluster of Asian countries, and it's all of them investing in the poorest countries off to the left hand side, like Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh and so forth. And you can fully expect this pattern to continue where Asians will deepen their integration because of the demographic and technological complementarities that we, ha that we have. So it's all well and good to have this kind of, you know, armchair geopolitical consensus that's authored by people who don't know a lot about economics or about technology and view everything through, the, through a structural realist prism. But when you look at the real world, how the real world has always operated and operates today, it tells you a very different story. So I just don't know how we get away with this sort of theoretical murder, you know? And, uh, and so I'm, you know, part of me is out to correct that, even though I promise not to make this talk all that theoretical. Now let me get into uh, Belt and Road, something that is, um, you know, front and center. And this is, you know, globalization with Asian characteristics, right? Globalization, Chinese style, some may say. And uh, what's critical to understand here is that everything, every single thing that's associated with Belt and Road is globalization. So you can't possibly, on the one hand, agree that you know, Belt and Road is the largest coordinated infrastructure investment program in human history, uh, spanning more than 100 countries on all continents, and then talk about deglobalization, and globalization is collapsing, because you literally will get on two different pages of the Financial Times on the same day those contradictory impulses. That's just unacceptably you know, hypocritical, right? So Belt and Road is one of the major drivers of globalization today. But just to remind everyone that Belt and Road existed before it had a name, right? Belt and Road was born the day the Soviet Union collapsed. For 30 years, Asians have been building these infrastructure corridors with each other. Japan has been the major financier, the Asian Development Bank, even the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And now you have China's Belt and Road adding more ammunition, a bazooka, you might say, in terms of the, 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 the capital value of lending and investment that's helping to finance all of these uh, highways and railways and internet cables and, uh, and electricity grids between Asian countries. Now remember, in this rectangle live about 5 billion people, right? The majority of the world population lives just in this rectangle. You don't even need a big spherical globe to understand, you know, kind of the, the demographic center of gravity and why it is that if you take a bunch of countries, many of which are uh, post-colonial, obviously, so very little new infrastructure investment in the last, say, 70, 75 years, or post-Soviet republics, the, the ones of Central Asia that are landlocked, they're desperate to have all of this new infrastructure investment, even if it carries a certain amount of potentially unsustainable debt because they simply cannot participate in the world economy, even trade more with their neighbors, if, it, if not for more infrastructure investment. And so it's actually no surprise to me, though, again, we have left very quickly in, in generally speaking, in our Anglo-American narrative towards a very cynical view of Belt and Road, two things. Number one, if you look at it, just a simple view of geography, most of what motivated China's investments in Belt and Road infrastructure here across terrestrial Eurasia is because of the so-called Malacca Trap. And the Malacca Trap is an ancient problem in geopolitics, right? How do you circumvent these, these choke points, these maritime choke points? Now, China in the 1990s became the largest importer of commodities in the world. Go back to my first slide with the pink countries of West Asia exporting oil 
to East Asia, it all goes through here, right? South of India, through the Indian Ocean, and through the Straits of Malacca, and up here. And it became the largest exporter of finished goods in the world, right? All of our uh, electronics and gizmos started to become made in China. So China didn't want to be beholden to this little Malacca trap. And they said, well, let's start to build these infrastructures across Central Asia. So we have diversification of our supply chains, a perfectly logical and noble and sensible objective. And indeed, actually, I feel quite validated. The Economist just two weeks ago did a whole article saying China's supposedly imperialist Belt and Road looks quite defensive in nature. I never thought I would see The Economist write something like that because they are so cynical about anything and everything that, that, that China does. And it shouldn't surprise you either that two very American entities, the Rand Corporation, of course a military funded think tank, and Citigroup, an American investment bank, have both done econometric analyses of the uh, impact of the investment of uh, Belt and Road projects and transportation infrastructure on the trade uh, volumes and exports for individual developing countries that participate in Belt and Road. And they have actually used this phrase win-win. And win-win is straight out of Xi Jinping's uh, lexicon. And yet you've got American firms, again, not the political consensus of people who don't understand you know, how infrastructure, supply chains, investment, and trade work, but rather people who actually follow what's happening on the ground and measure it. Those people say, well, this has been incredibly good for, Turkmen for uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and, and quite a few other countries. So we can get into the specific episodes of debt traps like Sri Lanka or countries like Laos and so on. We can get into to those, but the future of building and financing infrastructure across Eurasia does not hinge on what happens in Laos, right? The fact is that it's a much, much broader set of countries, and by and large, it's an overall positive experience, and that's why it continues to, to, uh, to reinforce itself. Now, there's a very strong geopolitical characteristic to all of this, not just China's defensive slash, you know, sort of uh, 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 neo, neo mercantile uh, aspirations, but also it's the fact that we've been making these linear projections about how Belt and Road would play out. If China builds something, it owns it, therefore it owns the country. It's bought the country, right? That's the end of the sovereignty of that country. But what we've forgotten is that there are reactions to actions. There are feedback loops all the time. And three years ago, just three years ago, when we were uh, you know, hyperventilating about the neo-imperialist Chinese plot known as Belt and Road, we forgot that it would inspire and motivate what I call the infrastructure arms race. And a chunk of this book is about that infrastructure arms race, where you see how suddenly Japan and India and the European Union have just announced that they're going to do big set of, um, of infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure finance projects. They want to compete to provide the lowest cost of borrowing for developing countries to build their infrastructure so that those countries don't become dependent on China. The United States has launched a whole new government agency fusing together a few others to also get involved in this infrastructure arms race. So suddenly, the, all of the countries on this map have a choice. It's not just China or nothing. Right? It's not just a debt trap and uh, neo-colonialism or nothing. Now you have an entire marketplace of infrastructure finance um, from which to choose, and that means that, that in fact, it is win-win in the end, and that it's not a, a sort of, sort of you know, China-only kind of picture. And we've evolved very, very quickly from a situation where people viewed Belt and Road as a purely unilateral hegemonic exercise into a process, a pattern, that in my view is going to restore the geopolitical structure that Asia has largely had for 4,000 years, which is not to be dominated by China, but to be multipolar. Because what is happening already in a very short amount of time is that countries, whether they're borrowing from China or borrowing from someone else, are using this infrastructure investment to modernize and to grow and to gain confidence, to pay, pay down their debts, so that, and to become more confident so that they can actually resist Chinese encroachment. And so that explains why, independent of each other, um, there's been a renegotiation over the status of the, uh, of the Chinese leased port in Sri Lanka. In the new Malaysian government, which is actually the old government of Mahathir, has come in and you know, they, were able to, they just ripped up Chinese plans for the East Coast Railway. Uh, even countries with very little leverage, like Myanmar, have been able to renegotiate down their debt to China. Pakistan, which had a $60 billion 
package with the China Pakistan Economic Corridor, that's been brought down to under $30 billion. So country after country is saying, wait a minute, we don't want to fall into a debt trap. We actually just came out of centuries of colonialism, and we don't want to go back to that. Right? And there's this historical memory combined with geopolitical competition that is enabling these countries to navigate their way in dealing with China such that you will actually not have a uh, unipolar landscape, but in, you will in fact re restore in many ways Asian multipolarity. You can see it in the geopolitical alignments as well with the Quad, something that Australia is obviously an active participant in. Japan, Australia, India, and the United States forging various kinds of military, particularly naval cooperation, and even helping secondary countries, such as the littoral uh, countries of the South China Sea, like the Philippines and Vietnam and Indonesia, to strengthen their capability to, uh, to defend their interests. So overall, I see a picture where you know, if you think about geopolitics absent the complexity that the, the James specializes in, right, with the kind of quantum view of uh, feedback loops, when you, take, when you ignore that stuff, you just take this view of, well, China built it, it owns it, therefore you get a unipolar world, and China replaces America, and that's the end of the conversation. Whereas if you have a complexity kind of approach, and you view all the feedback loops that are materializing as a result of what China does and others do, you come to very different conclusions about the structure uh, of, of Asian power and of, and of global uh, power. So uh, final couple of points. Global governance. You know, we... If in our global governance discourse, it's pretty much, you know, for the last 25 years been about, you know, Western-centric institutions, the post-Cold War Bretton Woods institutions and the United Nations institutions as the center of global governance. And we measure the influence that a country has in diplomacy by the extent to which it has voting rights, shares, seats, and influence within those bodies. And what we missed is that in the last 30 years, Asians have basically been saying, well, why don't we just build our own institutions? And this goes back to the post-Asian financial crisis kind of landscape. So what I wanted to show you here is this sort of Venn diagram of Asian sets of, of institutions and organizations. You've got the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership I mentioned earlier, ASEAN in the middle, and on the left, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which was founded by China. It is the fastest growing multilateral institution in world history, probably by, by far. There's way too many members for me to even fit inside that circle. You have uh, strange, you know, the Asian store participating in Asian infrastructure finance and benefiting from the trade linkages with Asia is such a compelling proposition that countries as far afield as Iceland and Chile and so forth have been joining the AIIB, even though they're nowhere near Asia. And uh, that tells you something about how Asians are able to simply take the template of historical experience and the codes of conduct and the legal kinds of frames that serve as the foundation for Western slash global institutions and simply borrow that, import that, and build Asian institutions instead. And I see that as a part of this process of Asians rapidly building their confidence. So I'll, I'll start to wind down just with a couple of you know, historical and geopolitical points. Uh, the first is that, as I said at the very beginning, you know, this is not the first period of history where Asia has been a system. And if you go back to the pre-colonial world, and this was for me the most fascinating part of, of my research because I'm not a historian, you know, historians use this term Afro-Eurasia to describe the 15th and 16th centuries of trade patterns and linkages that brought together the, the, the co sort of component terms uh, within this word Afro-Eurasia, Africa, Europe, Asia. And so there was this Afro-Eurasian world that was most of the world in terms of global uh, demographics and trade in the 15th and 16th centuries. And in many ways, what's happening uh, with Belt and Road, with the AIB, with this sort of you know, Asia outbound globalization is the reconstitution of this Afro-Eurasian world. So for those who like to see the echoes and parallels of history, I'm far more inclined to you know, urge you to study this period of history from the Asian point of view than to make your predictions about the future of the world based on the prism of our conventional IR theories that are rooted in about 250 years of uh, you know, Western European experience, right? It doesn't tell you a whole lot about how Asians have interacted with each other uh, over time. I'm going to just skip over just to the final point here about the kind of global structure. You know, I wanted to emphasize, and this is a, 
as James pointed out, in some of the European editions of this book, they added a question mark, and in others, uh, they didn't. You know, and it seems to indicate or denote the difference between a confident appraisal of Asia versus a more sort of hesitant one. At no point, though, did I want to imply that you know, the rise of Asia, whether it continues along its current trajectory or not, would represent a, a, a substitution of the West. You know, I've argued now, going back uh, to 2007, you know, 2008, that we are entering a very unique period of history in which you have a fairly permanent uh, multipolar structure uh, to the world. You know, again, the rise of China does not mean that the United States is no longer a superpower. You still have an Atlantic world, you have a, an American system, a European system, and an Asian system. You have, you've never, we've never had a landscape where all continents and regions of the world were simultaneously important, not equally important. We still have a world of, of hierarchies uh, of power, right? Africa and South America are not as important as, uh, say, you know, Europe and Asia. But we have a world of sort of uh, free and voluntary relations amongst all the regions of the world. And that, that's what I'm depicting here with these circles and the connections between them. So to me, what's truly unique about the 21st century that, that, isn't, that doesn't really have a historical uh, parallel is this truly global and distributed multipolar system in which even though you have hierarchy, you don't actually have uh, a structure of uh, colonial hegemony or imperial, global imperial hegemony where one power sits at the center and orders the relations of the others such as you've had as recently as into the 20th century. Instead, I've left the center of the circle basically empty, right, as it should be. It doesn't mean it's an apolar world. It doesn't mean it's a G G0 world, right? There are very clear power centers in the world, but they're all able to determine who they're going to engage with, and no one can really stop them from doing so. So regionalism, we come back to regions, as I said at the beginning, regions matter a lot. There's a very strong regional gravity. To the extent that there is any so-called deglobalization, it is a retrenchment into optimizing activity within these regions, which simply reinforces the fact that actually regionalism is an important stepping stone and, and a big part of globalization. Now, two of these regions that matter uh, a lot in the world are East Asia and West Asia, and they're both Asian regions. So there is, again, a certain uh, gravity or growing gravity to the role of Asia collectively in this system, even as East and West Asia still are not as integrated uh, fully. But that's, that's happening more and more. You can see this in the behavior of Russia, of Turkey, of Saudi Arabia. These are three countries that had Western leanings, in a way, or orientation strategically, owing to colonialism or their desire to join Western institutions. Think about Turkey and its application to join the European Union. If you look at Turkey today, this is not exactly a candidate to join the European Union, right? Turkey is now just as likely to drop out of NATO and join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, as it is to stay within NATO. So in the last 25 years, some of the major swing states that are lie in between Europe and Asia, again, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Russia are leaning ever more uh, to the East rather than the West. But to me, in this geopolitical uh, multipolar landscape, it's not really about which single power uh, dominates. It's much more about being a, a, a resource provider, a utilities provider in what I've called the, the geopolitical marketplace. You know, we tend to say, well, you know, the United States still has the largest, most powerful military. It still has the exorbitant privilege of the U.S. dollar. Still has very large tech companies and 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 so forth. And therefore, it's number one. The way I view it is that pretty much all of these uh, uh, measurements or factor endowments of power are more or less commoditized. Right? We live in a world with three hundred trillion dollars of financial uh, assets, mostly debt. You know, we have more or less infinite liquidity that that any one country that is capable of doing so can lend to others. We have many nuclear powers in the world and strong militaries that can engage in alliance relationships and support and sell uh, weapons to each other. Technology has become a commodity, right? It certainly isn't just what comes out of Silicon Valley. So you can get your Huawei 5G or your you know, WeChat ecosystem or your payments platform from any number of vendors. It doesn't have to be the United States or even necessarily just China. So to me, finance, uh, military uh, uh, partnership, technology, and other sorts of uh, goods are, in a way, commodities that powers have to compete to supply, compete to provide in this geopolitical marketplace. And that, to me, is the, 
correct way to understand how geopolitics is unfolding. It's not an either or kind of world where either you choose China or you choose America. This is the new landscape and it's something that is uh, fundamentally new. And Asia's role, as I sort of strive to point out, is not to displace the system, not to build a new system around it, but simply to take its kind of rightful place in a world that was dominated by Europe in the 19th century, dominated America in the, in the 20th century, and now in the 21st century of a truly multipolar world, and Asia will coexist in a way with those traditional power centers. So it's one of these kind of buckle up sorts of moments because you can't really, you know, make your future predictions based on, you know, narrow Western European experience. You have to think much more broadly and integrate the Asian past and, and the Asian story in a way into your forecasts uh, of the future. And so I leave it in some ways uh, open-ended, but uh, in a way there's a consistency to still believing that a globalization is going to be as strong as ever because you have more power centers than ever, all of which see certain benefit in engaging with each other for different uh, uh, purposes. But I know we can have a much longer debate and conversation this evening about what the competing ambitions are uh, of, uh, of, of leading powers in the world. They're obviously they're, they're divergent political systems and so forth. So I really look forward to that part of the conversation to begin right now. I want to thank you again. Thank you, James. Thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you. So um, I've asked Siobhan to sort of prime the pump with a few questions and get the conversation going, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Please keep your questions uh, short, concise, and so we get as many possible in. And, and uh, afterwards, there'll be a short book signing um, up top. Uh, the books are a very appealing price, much less than I paid for mine, I realize. So um, we're looking forward to the next stage. There's plenty to work with here. So uh, Siobhan, it's, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for that. That was very informative, I think, for all of us. Um, one thing you touched on uh, sort of close towards the beginning was the RCEP, or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Deal, for which our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has been in Thailand this week to negotiate. That deal has been in development for about seven years, I believe. And as you mentioned, India have now said they're out. And I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on what some of India's concerns are. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, again, trade liberalization in Asia and globally is an incremental process. It doesn't depend anymore only on a WTO kind of reform. You know, we haven't had a new WTO round in, in a couple of decades at this point. And it doesn't depend only on the RCP because even all RCP members are negotiating with each other to deepen trade bilaterally. So I don't view this as sort of a devastating blow, right? Trade within Asia is going to continue to grow no matter what. And even from the Indian standpoint, India's calculation was that it still has, uh, you know, it has a very large trade deficit with China and with Southeast Asian uh, countries. And the reciprocal liberalization that was, um, that it had hoped for with RCP wasn't really going to happen because RCP doesn't cover services and services like software services, think about TCS, you probably have a TCS building here in Sydney, right? Uh, are the largest you know, sort of most profitable component of India's exports. So if services are not covered and India signs RCEP, it's going to wind up simply having a larger deficit than it already has with its neighbors. So they sort of backed out. But, but at the same time, as Modi himself said, they look forward to deepening their trade with all other Asian countries through bilateral or sub-regional negotiations that would include services and therefore benefit India more. So, you know, we, we often make the mistake in global governance of conflating an institution with the issue. If the WTO disappeared tomorrow, you'd still have trade, right? If the UN Security Council disappeared tomorrow, you'd still have alliance relationships and negotiations over deployment of peacekeepers and so forth. So never confuse one negotiation or organization with the much broader set of issues that, that it purports to represent. These organizations actually play a much lesser role than one thinks. Another thing you touched on, and I've, I've heard you speak about it before, is that you're much less concerned about China's imperialist ideals than a lot of other people. But here in Australia, we talk a lot and we hear a lot about Chinese developments in the South Pacific and the small island nations, Vanuatu in particular at the moment. As that doesn't fit in with the Belt and Road 
aspect of China's ambitions. What do you think that expansion into the South Pacific is about? Well, in a way it does in the sense that we often forget, and I certainly you know, mistakenly sort of elided here, that, that, uh, that, that Belt and Road is equal parts maritime and terrestrial, right? So the, 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 um, it's even in, built into the Chinese phrasing of the term. There's the terrestrial part and the maritime uh, component of it. So those, those ambitions are there, those relationships are there, those countries are participants, uh, many of them in Belt and Road. They've either see it in their interest or they've been financially you know, or diplomatically co-opted into it, whatever the case may be. To some degree, it's, you know, again, in some countries in the Indian Ocean and the South Pacific, it may be related to trade, but it's most certainly also has a dual use characteristic, right? A you know, military potential. It could be that it's about expanding a port infrastructure and deepening it. So, you know, we often forget that China has been very important in the uh, management of the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, and actually with its uh, oil and gas exploration activities worldwide is part of the reason why oil and gas prices have come down so much is because of Chinese capital and Chinese state-owned energy companies going into and developing these global energy assets. Now, it's a separate issue if we think it's a good thing for the climate. Obviously, it's not. But the point is, in terms of building infrastructures that enhance the and, and, and make more friction-free global, global trade, that's part of what China is doing with the Maritime Belt and Road projects. When it, and again, there are military dimensions to it. If you think of both the South China Sea and the South Pacific, clearly it's it's what I call use it or lose it uh, you know, strategy. I, I did a chapter of a previous book about this. I said basically China is looking at these geographies that have you know, South China Sea Islands that no one has used or claimed that have a u utility, especially given the hydrocarbon resources that are, that are below or the ability to use them to protect uh, overseas supply chains. It says no one's been using it, so we're going to use it. It's use it or lose it. You know? and, and the de facto control over those assets matters more to them than, than the de jure you know, negotiation or, or, or demarcation of, of who owns them. I would say that, you know, there, we often forget when we observe this Chinese activity that we have a certain agency here. You know, if you think about Sri Lanka, uh, Indians have been kicking themselves for more than a decade because that Hambantota port project that I alluded to uh, earlier that China had financed and then Sri Lanka was going to default on some debt, so it leased that port to uh, China for 99 years. That project was offered to India 10 years ago. And in typical Indian fashion, they just sort of, you know, circled around in New Delhi and never did anything about it. So the first thing that Prime Minister Modi did upon his re-election earlier this year was to go to Sri Lanka and say, we're your brothers, we're your friends, if you need money, if you need infrastructure, you know, come to us, don't come to China, right? And so overnight, in a way, these grand visions attributed to China, but that China may or may not sort of hold, but certainly we have presumed the worst that, you know, uh, China seeks to re restore the Ming dynasty and have treasure fleets, you know, across the Indian Ocean. That all came to naught overnight, overnight. All it took was a bad press over one port deal and Modi getting reelected in India to rip up these, you know, huge, you know, visions and, and, and dystopian sort of visions. So, we, we forget that we have agency in this. You know, you can work with those governments as, as we're doing. So, you know, Australia and New Zealand, the United States are partnering in Papua New Guinea to do, to, you know, do infrastructure projects that China would otherwise have done and so forth. So it's not just up to China what happens in terms of its relations across uh, this region. It's, it's very much up to you and to those governments as well. But it would be very hard for Vanuatu, for an example, to reject very lucrative offers of development projects. Well, it depends, again, because we have this historical learning that we forget. These are not necessarily just transactions that are occur occurring today without the benefit of understanding you know, the past uh, kind, of, kind of experience. And that's why you've had these countries in Southeast Asia and Central Asia rapidly going back to China and renegotiating, saying, actually, we don't want to be caught in this debt trap. We don't want to become your wholly owned subsidiary, right? We don't want to relive the, the uh, British colonial uh, experience. And countries are, again, tacitly watching each other. It's not an accident 
that within about six months of the Hamantota port fiasco, you had countries as far as East Africa and Central Asia and Mongolia and Myanmar going back to China and saying, we need to renegotiate things. We've seen what just happened in Sri Lanka. And what I said at the time is the reason you're not going to have another Sri Lanka-like situation is because Sri Lanka happened. And this is what I mean about feedback loops. You know, So when you look at a case like a Vanuatu, you, you know, what they should be saying is, oh, hold on, let's look at what just happened in the Maldives, right? And, uh, and, and how that country is also taking on too much debt to China signing up to projects it doesn't need, mm -hmm. right, at, at terms that it could get far more favorably from other powers. And so those countries need to be educated into how they could make smarter decisions in their own best interests, while also still getting the infrastructure that they, that they may very well need. And just one final question from me. One thing that I don't think we've really touched on is the social butting of heads, if you like. So how in this Asian future are sort of Western liberal ideals going to fit alongside, you know, censorship in China, gender-based violence in India, what's happening in Hong right. Kong, all these very strong social issues that really go against a lot of what we yeah. in the West stand for? I think, for. you know, when you look at most Asian countries, they, they don't for, I mean, let me just make a, a macro point first. One of one of the key things or in misunderstandings in in Western countries, I would say outside of Australia, but in the geographic West about Asia, is that Asia is this monolithic Chinese sphere of influence, and it's kind of a you know a, a big authoritarian block. But remember that more people in Asia live in democracies than not. Right. I mean, earlier this year, we had elections in India, in Indonesia, in the Philippines. That right there is 1.8 billion people, leaving aside Japan and South Korea and yourselves and New Zealand. Right. So Asia is largely populated by democracies, and most of the citizens and residents of this Asian region live in democratic societies with democratic culture. They may not be the most well-respected and sort of pedigreed you know, procedural democracies, electoral democracies, or liberal democracies, but they are democracies. So it's important not to, when we talk about governance in Asia, not to begin the conversation with China. I, I actually sort of, you know, I try even just as a rhetorical device to reject the way in which we do this, because every time, you know, we have a conversation, so let's talk about governance in Asia. China is authoritarian. It's like, so what? So what? There's more, far more people in democracies in Asia than there are in China. So why are we talking about China? When you see how China treats its citizens and when you see what they do with social credit and surveillance, and so forth, do you want to live in China? Right? The more China acts like the China that we don't want to see China become like, the more other countries will want to preserve the non-Chinese democratic systems that they have. Right? We have to absolutely remember that. We have agency in this. This is not a Chinese region. This is Asia. Right? So let me just emphasize that the, by the law of numbers and history and culture and, and political systems, this is not a uh, authoritarian region. It's not China is an authoritarian country. Absolutely it is. But this is a much more diverse region in terms of political systems. What they do have in common, though, is the desire for better governance. Right? And if that means becoming a more of an electoral democracy, a li liberal democracy, you know, sort of having the trappings of democracy and liberalism and rule of law, great. Generally speaking, what, of course, Asian countries want is to sustain their economic growth and, you know, the, the benefits in terms of improved standard of living and welfare for their people. And the factor that correlates most to that outcome is rule of law, not so much democracy. And that, of course, China proves that point, as do other countries in Asia. So do countries undertake the kinds of reforms consistent with rule of law? Yes, we see more of that. I have, a, if, the, if the slide deck is still up, there's a slide for everything. Well, here you go. So just to be as, as um, quote-unquote impartial as possible, I took only the surveys and data from the World Bank and from, the, from, from Freedom House and from the Economist uh, Intelligence Unit, so entirely Western organizations, and I looked at their rankings of Asian countries according to whether their government capacity is improving, are they becoming better governed countries, and are they becoming more inclusive? And inclusiveness can mean allowing more political parties, having more free and fair elections, and all sorts of other metrics of uh, sort of you know, general social freedom. And as you can see, with very, very few exceptions that are more or less very episodic anomalies like a coup in Thailand or the sort of corruption scandals in Malaysia, what you see here is that the arrows are moving up and to the right, by and large. Asian societies, according to Western metrics, are becoming better governed. They have more effective governments with higher state capacity. State capacity is a fancy way of saying 
Can you deliver basic services to your people, right? The things that really constitute being a functional state to begin with. And inclusiveness can be democratic characteristics. You can see the evidence right here that Asians are getting better at governing themselves in ways that we would say are consistent with the rule of law and electoral democracy and liberalism. They may not be getting there as fast as we would like. China is certainly not going there anytime fast or, or at all, but most of Asia is. So it should not, even the very question should not be phrased as, you know, us versus them our Western liberal systems and their authoritarianism. The truth is that there is a lot of convergence going on. And there's a lot of learning going on. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I, I would say this also, I'll, I'll just make you know, an anecdotal point about, about living in, uh, in, in Singapore, as I do, and being associated with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, which is a, you know, it's kind of like the Kennedy School for Asia. We get plane loads of, uh, of civil servants, of ministers, mayors, bureaucrats from India, from China, from Indonesia, Russia, Kazakhstan, every single week coming in, learning how to better run, you know, how to administratively govern a country, not how to be an authoritarian state, how to actually deliver public services and welfare and so forth. And so I see this learning process where countries are saying, I want to have a national health system. I want to deliver health care to all my citizens at as low a price point as possible. Well, how can I learn from what India is doing with telemedicine, right? How can I learn from what, um, what uh, South Korea is doing with public-private you know, payments into health care or other countries? And that's what's actually happening in Asia, not a, a black and white sort of you know, very high-level intellectual kind of uh, uh, conversation or debate or dichotomy. And I think that's the healthy thing that's happening, you know. So I don't think that we should fear this kind of bad authoritarian window. We should certainly fear what China is doing in its country to its own people. We should look very closely at the technologies that it exports and the practices it may try to export and uh, what impact that may have. But remember, as I said before, in response to your earlier question, we, haven't, we have a role to play there, there as well, right? But what I see across the board over the last 20 years of backpacking around Asian countries is that everywhere I go, I see leaders, bureaucrats striving to run their countries better than they did a generation ago. If you think about the Asian financial crisis in the 90s, Governments just buried their heads in the sand. They had no idea how to run an economy. You know, today you go to these countries, and, and, and below the level of these authoritarian strongmen that we fear, you have a whole stratum, a large number of professional, often Western-trained, young, publicly spirited bureaucrats who want to figure out how to get infrastructure done right, how to do an education system well, how to spread broadband internet access, all of these things. And that is the real meat of governance across Asian countries. And they're clearly doing a good job because we can see the results improving. All right. We've, we've really pushed for time, so I think we'll just do a few questions from the audience. Please wait for the roving microphones to come to you so we can make sure we can hear what you're saying. Hi, um, my name is Alfred. I'm very much aware of the context of where the world we live in myself. I'm actually from Indonesia originally, then I migrated to Australia, and then inadvertently, as I'm doing refugee advocacy um, in Australia, I've been learning a lot about um, Australia's relationship with the cooperation in managing the refugee population and migration in Southeast Asia and beyond. And that actually led me to open a lot more conversations about Asia in general. There isn't really uh, an extensive discussion on human rights topic in general in Asia. Frankly, a lot of the politicians are corrupt in itself, and there's a lot of dysfunctionalities within those countries. I know they're trying to be better, but my question is, is, it, is human rights really a rich thing, a rich country thing, considering that Asia is still largely developing? Or can Asia, even, even it's a developing stage right now, can actually achieve the basic human rights that it needs for the um, hundreds of millions of minorities that exist within Asia? We'll take two more questions and we'll come back. That's why I'm writing them down. I don't want to miss anything. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you. I've noticed in the crowd here there'll be a number of university students, and I, my, I myself am a recent, gra fairly recent graduate. You've, meant, you've talked about all this infrastructure investment and, oh, the chance to things are unlocking and, oh, you could go and be an entrepreneur. But my question is specifically, 
infrastructure financed investment sounds really exciting to me. How can we get involved? How can sort of the uni level and the recent grads really sort of get involved in these opportunities that are coming up to and enhance and build our career in this type of sort of space? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Brilliant. And we've got one more over here on the right. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Tim Baines. I'm a military analyst from US Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, so my lens is obviously focused on pretty narrowly, but you spoke a lot about how China is beset, you know, beset on all sides by these other Asian countries that are democratic and they're, they're improving and why would they want to be Asia? But what actions or motivations do we see by China to be not so kind or not so benign? What do we need to be concerned about as far as China's encroachment to the region, taking into consideration how they use their military as a tool for uh, ignoring international rule of law and the, enforcing the nine dash line and fisheries and things like that. Thank you. Great. Okay, that was three questions. Let me take them in reverse order. I think that you know, let, let's assume the worst in terms of uh, Chinese intent in these specific situations, but let's treat them specifically rather than uh, believing that there is one comprehensive response. So you know, much of our response in the West has been to wrangle over whether Pacific Command should be renamed Indo-Pacific Command, and you know very well how much time went into that and now how many plaques have to be sort of, you know, re-stapled re and so forth. So, you know, let's get beyond that and focus on on, on how we actually respond. And I think that the Quad is a very good example of that because it has the support of the indigenous participants, right, who want to see not the, the US or Australia lead from the front in terms of con containing China, which, which actually is very worrisome to them because they don't like this sort of containment because, of course, China is their largest trading partner uh, and they have other you know, kinds of deep relations with China, but rather in terms of capacity building. So I referenced earlier how Australia, India, Japan, the US are working when building the capacity of the Philippines, Vietnam in particular, Indonesia. I'm a big supporter of this, un, un, unmitigated. I believe that this is how you help to build a kind of equilibrium in Asia that is not dependent on the artificial crutch, if you will, of, of you know, permanent and very expensive American external you know, offshore uh, balancing, which is in any case not necessarily effective and certainly not proven to be effective or less and less effective over time as we go forward, given America's decreasing willingness to, to, to finance it in perpetuity. So it's very important that we move from an offshore balancing containment kind of mentality towards a indigenous capacity building, regional equilibrium kind of uh, a strategy. So I think that one by one, working with those governments to, to you know, resolve, ideally, the, the bilateral tensions that they have with China is critical. With China, Japan, I mean, that's got a dynamic of its own. But in the South China Sea, there's no question that one can take certain steps to, even if one cannot claim back you know, territories that have been seized, one can force a negotiation which there is a final settlement over the status of these islands, which then diminishes the need for there to be this endless spiral of escalation and mil militarization of those territories. Let me take, let me jump back to the first question on, 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 on human rights. You know, this is not a new debate or conversation, obviously, in terms of this issue. And, and you know, there is a caricature that Asians, you know, focus on economic and to a smaller extent social rights rather than political rights. Again, I think that's a terribly unfair characterization uh, of Asians because Asia has plenty of civil society movements and people power movements and Asian governments, Asian societies have been overthrowing their leaders in the name uh, uh, of their rights and interests and democracy, uh, going back to the you know Marcos regime in the Philippines and Suharto in, in your country and, and so forth. So I believe that it's important not to denigrate Asians with these false uh, dichotomies. There's a broader set uh, of, of rights, whether it is the political, gradual, incremental political liberalization that is clearly documented in the data that I've shown, or whether it is the push for greater recognition of uh, minority rights and so forth that, that you've referenced. And they're going to be outlier cases where you know you're still going to have a perpetuation or or in a way an instigation 
of ethnic kinds of campaigns, like against uh, the Rohingya in Myanmar and so forth. And this has a lot to do, obviously, with the legacies of colonialism and the way borders are drawn and the way multi-ethnic societies have been created out of out of the British Empire. And obviously, just the fact that, um, much like in the in the Balkan, you know, sort of uh, situation, you're going to have um, uh, peoples that don't want to be governed in the same regime that favors one party uh, over the other. And that's what's that's what's going on. But that doesn't invalidate the case that actually, you know, many Asian societies, whether it's, uh, you know, from Thailand down to Singapore, India, are, are very multi-ethnic and diverse countries and, um, you know, make a lot of effort to maintain that kind of multi-ethnic harmony. So one Rohingya, uh, you know, sort of, uh, um, and it, it's a very, very, very tragic and unnecessary, uh, you know, sort of uh, a, a pogrom going on uh, there. But it still doesn't invalidate the broader notion that there is a, a growing recognition recognition, actually, uh, across Asia of minority rights and of recognition of human rights uh, as well. So again, I think it's just an ongoing kind of issue. And then the final point, though, on, just on that question, is around poverty, right? So what constitutes, you know, the sort of the, 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 what is the actual priority? When you even say human rights, do you really think that the two billion, you know, desperately poor people that still inhabit this Asian region wake up every day with their first priority being, you know, as my country signed the Universal Declaration of Human Human rights or not, right? And the answer is most likely not. You know, and I think that part of the way you achieve rights, and this is where I would sympathize with what used to be the so-called Asian position in these debates, is that, you know, we have to keep our eye on the ball and focus on human development, right? And human development is to some degree very much economic and social as much or even you know, in a pr prior to it being uh, political. It's very difficult for people to exercise political rights without a certain degree of, yeah. You know, Again, I don't, I don't sympathize with this, with any kind of system that you're pointing out is abusive. I'm, I'm completely on your side of that debate in any case. But let me get to the, the, the question about, about students. You know, I, I'm very passionate about this because, again, you see in the numbers, and I see this in even the research students that I bring on board for, for my projects, there is this growing kind of, you know, pan-Asian uh, conversation. I'd love to see Australians be more a part of it. You know, you're a leading education center here in this country. You know, uh, obviously, a a education is categorized as an export, and it's one of your, your more important uh, exports out of this country. You're now offshoring, if you will, or investing in university expansion in Indonesia and other countries to, to bring that high-quality Australian education uh, to other countries. You see more and more Australians, for sure, going and studying abroad in Asian countries as well. Um, Australia needs to be more of an investor in the Asian growth story uh, outside of infrastructure where you have Macquarie, which is the largest you know, infrastructure asset owner in this country and, and, and globally, largely because of the Australian assets it holds. And your financial institutions and others need to do a lot more to go abroad and invest abroad and expand. But the way your corporate governance works and in a way some of the, the mentality in the corporate community among an older generation, you, Australian companies are almost penalized from taking, for taking the so-called risk of going and expanding into Asia despite the enormous opportunities that it represents. And so that's really something that is Australia's own fault, right? No one is stopping Australian companies. No one is stopping, you know, ANZ or others from going and being more engaged in these countries. It's actually Australian decision-making that's uh, prohibiting that, uh, preferring instead to just stay in the local safe kind of uh, uh, market. So it's really going to be up to you. I try throughout, you know, in my chapter on Australia as well to kind of document the ways in which Australia can can be a, a positive contributor in the future landscape, uh, you know, socially, uh, commercially, and geopolitically in Australia. And I don't think that Australia, therefore, need to be needs to be as schizophrenic as it is. Right? Australia is very schizophrenic about whether or not it's even in Asia, whether or not you know it is uh, China or America, and it's got to be a choice between the two. And I've always viewed for 15 years of coming to Australia, all of these as completely false divides. And the more you accept that you are a part of this Asia, the more you'll accept the subtlety, the complexity, the multi-directional, multi-directionality of your engagement uh, uh, with Asia. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. All but right, well, uh, I'll hand back over to James. Let me just uh, close by. First of all, thanking Siobhan very much. And also two people, uh, our project officers, this would not happen without them. Claire Hodson, and usually in the back, and uh, Jose Toyabla, always behind the camera. Uh, I want to thank you both. And of course, our agent provocateur extraordinaire, 
our speaker, Dr. Parakana. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. I wish you a good evening and um, a peaceful future. Thank you very much. <laughs>